Hello, everyone, and welcome to the York Civil War Roundtable. My name is Adam Bentz, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Library and Archives at the York County History Center. Thank you very much for attending tonight's webinar, whether you registered or are viewing live on Facebook. And I think we have an excellent talk coming up for tonight. Perhaps uh, we could say it's a bit timely. Maybe people are a little bit tired of politics, maybe not. It's hard to get away from politics these days. But if you could bear with me, I am going to walk through an upcoming calendar of events. We have a lot of programming coming up at the History Center over the next month or so. Obviously tonight, we will be hearing from Scott Mingus talking about Civil War politics. But on, uh, but on Thursday, which is tomorrow at 12 noon, we will be presenting Ask an Archivist. It's a webinar featuring the Director of Library and Archives, Nicole Smith, and the Director of Collections, Rachel Warner. And that's a webinar. Uh, as I said, you can register for it, and we also plan to stream it live on Facebook. On November 21st, that's a Saturday at 1 p.m., we will be having another webinar, Beginning Genealogy Online. And uh, York County History Center member and volunteer, Rebecca Anstein, will be giving her experience and suggestions to those of you who are planning to get started doing genealogy research. Obviously, uh, online is the place that so many people get started today, and there are a lot of useful sources online it's a bit tricky to navigate, so uh, Rebecca will be helping people with that. A week later, the following Saturday, we will be, that's November 28th, uh, starting at 10 a.m., we will be featuring an 18th century cooking demonstration. Our manager of public programs, Christine Cooper, will demonstrate cooking at the Summer Kitchen, which is at the Colonial Complex. This is a drop-in event. Uh, it is family-friendly and it will be running between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. on Saturday, November 28th. Okay, the next event coming up on December 3rd at 7 p.m., that's Thursday, uh, December 3rd, will be our Writers Roundtable, which is a library and archives event. Um, historian Samantha Dorm will be discussing her efforts and uh, her group's efforts at the restoration of Lebanon Cemetery, which is uh, a famous and often overlooked African-American cemetery in York. And she'll be discussing restoration attempts that have been made over the last few years. That meeting will be taking place in the meeting hall at the History Center. Following that on December 12th at 10.30 a.m., we will be featuring our second Saturday lecture. This one will be the last one, obviously, for the year, and it will be presented by Ron Kirkwood, who I believe spoke to the round table last year about his, uh, about his work on the George Spangler Farm Hospital. His talk on December 12th will be Women to the Rescue at the George Spangler Farm Hospital, of course, in the Battle of Gettysburg. Then a week after that, the final event uh, that I plan on, well, the final event uh, that I'll be talking about for the year, that's on December 19th at 1 p.m., Saturday, December 19th. Uh, myself and uh, the director of the Library and Archives, Nicole Smith, will be discussing using our website resources to do research on York County history. If you have not explored our website, we have quite a few features. We have some finding aids as well as a lot of online uh, visual collections, photo collections, and uh, we'll be discussing how to make use of those for either planning uh, in-person research or uh, being able to make use of the real resources that we have uploaded there. There's quite a bit available on our website right now. We've been adding a lot this year, obviously during the stay at home period and in the last few months. The final promotion I'd like to do uh, for tonight, and we um, are very happy to know about this. This is the next York, York uh, Civil War Roundtable event, which will be taking place on January 20th at 7 p.m. 
and we'll be welcoming Scott back to talk to us again. Uh, Scott will be joined by Jim McClure, and they will be discussing Civil War stories from York County, Pennsylvania. So as you may know, uh, 10 years ago, Scott and Jim collected Civil War stories from families in York County and the region. These stories came from Civil War era letters, newspaper accounts, diaries, and oral histories. Some accounts came from people who had met aged Civil War veterans gathering for the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, which is in 1938. The two historians published those stories in two volumes, Civil War Voices and more Civil War Voices, and then they continued gathering more stories and photographs for the next decade. In this third volume, Civil War Stories from York County, the authors added these new stories, dozens of them, to their combined earlier works. In this book, they give voice to those living, serving, and dying in the tumultuous Civil War era in York County and in South Central Pennsylvania. So they will be uh, discussing excerpts of their newest book on January 20th, and uh, I think we'll have a bit of trouble trying to condense all of, the, all of the different stories they've been able to find, but I'm sure it will be a well-attended event, um, and it can't get more local than this. So on that note, I'm just checking the question and answer here. Uh, okay, I will get back to that in a second. Uh, I'd like to keep Get back to my screen here. And uh, so I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker. And then I will step aside and I'll let Scott commence the talk. But I'm sure many people tonight, uh, many of our participants are familiar with Scott. He is a frequent speaker at roundtable events. But in case you're not aware, he is a retired research scientist who holds US patents in self adhesive postage stamps and barcode labels. He is a prolific author of 22 Civil War era books and articles for multiple publications, as well as six scenario books for Civil War miniature wargaming. He manages the Roundtable Facebook page, writes the Cannonball blog on yorkblog.com, and is a frequent speaker at our Roundtable events. He and his wife, Debbie, live in Manchester Township. His great-great-grandfather was a 15-year-old drummer and rifleman in the 51st Ohio Infantry in the Western Theater of the Civil War, and other family members fought at Antietam and Gettysburg in the 7th West Virginia of the Army of the Potomac. So, uh, deeply rooted in Civil War history and also a prolific author on local and national Civil War topics. Uh, I introduce Scott, and thank you for attending tonight's event. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks, Adam, for the warm welcome. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now and bring up my slides, and then we can get cracking. Uh, when I moved to York County in 2001 to go work for the paper company down in Spring Grove, I became keenly interested in the Civil War history of this area. And obviously over the years, I've written a few books about it, although certainly not the first person to write about our area. Well, one of the things that's really struck me is how interesting the politics were in York County. Uh, I've always been somewhat of a political junkie, being a Civil War guy growing up in Ohio uh, because of the long string of Civil War generals from Ohio that became president after the Civil War. Uh, and I lived in the same town that James Garfield lived in uh, a few hundred, more than 100 years apart. Uh, I've always been really interested in the political aspect of the Civil War. Uh, and York County is certainly no different. So what I'm going to do tonight for the next 45 or so minutes is to talk a little bit, kind of a sweeping overview, if you will, of the politics of this county. I'm not going to go into any real depth in anything, but I want to at least give the flavor what the residents of York County were thinking, what they were doing, who they were supporting, what the issues were back in the Civil War years. Now, let me preface the talk by remarking that, you know, there's been, always been a long, long history of strong connections between Maryland and Pennsylvania. Not always friendly. We fought a war against uh, Pennsylvania way back uh, long before the American Revolution when Cresap's War. Um, but the relations between Maryland and Pennsylvania generally have been very strong, particularly in the business front and in familial uh, family connections 
Uh, and obviously between the Susquehanna Trail, which was the main north-south highway in those years, and the Northern Central Railway that you know came into being in the 1850s, further tied York County to Maryland. Uh, particularly Southern York County was extremely well tied into Baltimore. Uh, and as such, you had a lot of residents in this area that, you know, they weren't really upset with the idea of slavery because in some regards, uh, it was being done in Maryland and there was certainly a, a need to uh, trade with the Marylanders and continue that uh, dialogue. Um, and A.B. Farker, a uh, young businessman at the time of the Civil War, uh, worked for the Pennsylvania Agricultural Works at the start of the war. He made this great quote, the York was distinctly Northern. We are, we are a Northern town, but the town in the Civil War days at least was not bitterly anti-Southern. Now contrast that to a lot of other Northern towns that were bitterly anti-Southern, particularly in New England, uh, where there was a lot of antithesis uh, towards some of the Southern states, particularly with the rhetoric that was going on over uh, issues you know, long before the war and tariffs and banking and central defense. And then of course, the big issue of slavery over time. But Pennsylvanians are really tied into Maryland. Uh, but that idea that the country was starting to fall apart uh, really started playing in uh, in the 1850s. Uh, by that point, there were 4 million people enslaved in the South, uh, there were 500,000 free blacks. Uh, including 1,204 that lived here in York County, according to the 1860 census. Uh, but the political winds were certainly changing. Uh, for many years, America had been a two or three party system with the Whigs and then the Know Nothings, and of course the Democrats being the uh, dominant political party in much of that year. Uh, by the early 1850s, the Whigs were out of, out of favor, the Know Nothings were falling apart. And for a brief period of time, we were pretty much a one-party system. Uh, and in the early 1850s in Ripon, Wisconsin, a new political party was founded, Republican Party. It's not until 1856 that we can find any evidence of the first uh, concerted effort, at least in York County, to get the Democratic uh, Party some competition on the local front. Uh, James Kell and a few other men here in York County were uh, founding the Republican Party. Now, for a brand new political party, they do fairly well in Pennsylvania. Uh, they run John C. Fremont, better known as the Pathfinder, later known as the Civil War General. Uh, but John Charles Fremont uh, had a very catchy, in fact, one of the most more memorable political phrases in all of American history. Uh, his adherents, including here in York County, uh, their rattling cry was free soil, free speech, free men, Fremont. Uh, and nationwide, for a brand new pre uh, presidential candidate from a new party, Fremont did pretty well. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, it gets 32% uh, of the vote. Again, the party's less than a year old. Uh, so it's tremendous, tremendous uh, showing at that point in time. And former president of the United States, Millard Fillmore, made one last appearance of the Know Nothings. Uh, but in 1856 was the last time that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, believe it or not, voted uh, for a Democrat as the presidential candidate until Franklin Roosevelt in 1936. So Pennsylvania certainly was changing to become a Republican area. The exception was here, York County. Um, now most York Countyans supported James Buchanan. There were Democrats, of course. Uh, Buchanan was a Democrat. He was from this region across the river in Lancaster County. Um, and so the Republicans really had to be content to uh, just kind of stay in the wings. But in 1859, the Republicans start flashing a little bit of political muscle when Frederick Saltzbach is the first Republican ever elected uh, from York County to be in the state legislature. Uh, he's the representative uh, from this county and serves uh, for his two-year term. Uh, and you can really see the wind changing Republican in the state. Uh, in 1860, on October 9th, Pennsylvania elects its very first Republican governor, Andrew Gregg Curtin. Curtin, of course, is going to be the governor throughout the Civil War uh, and will prove to be a pretty strong ally of uh, the Republican Party and President Lincoln. Uh, you can see in the chart, uh, the red, of course, as is today, uh, is uh, delineates the Republican Party, blue delineates the Democrats. Now those color schemes weren't used 
at the time of the Civil War, but at least gives you an idea that Governor Curtin is, you know, pretty strong, uh, running through much of the northern part of the state in particular. Uh, and the closer you got to the Delaware River or the closer you got to the border, the more Democrat support there was. And we talk a lot about politics today being heated and people not necessarily getting along over their political beliefs. Well, that hasn't changed over the years. In fact, in 1860, uh, Blinken, um, throughout the country, you know, you didn't have obviously the you know television or internet, so you most certainly didn't have robocalls and all the constant interruptions. Political campaigns were generally handled by surrogates who would come to a town and give fiery political speeches on behalf of some candidate or not, and then often leave. Uh, and such was the case in York in 1860 when a large group of Republicans, uh, part of a national organization of young Republicans called the White Awakes, uh, took the train across the bridge uh, from Columbia, Lancaster County, here to York, uh, which was a Democratic bastion. Uh, they made some speeches in downtown York about the uh, benefits of Congressman Abraham Lincoln from Illinois, former congressman, who was running for president at that point in time. And the Yorkers booed and hissed and started throwing rocks at these guys. And in fact, it got, the riot got so bad that the Republicans jumped back on the train and headed back to Lancaster County, uh, kind of leaving Lincoln alone. And that's the last time I think there was any major rallies for Abraham Lincoln and his running mate Hannibal Hamlin from Maine. Uh, here in York County. The 1860 election is pretty telling. Uh, York County is one of the counties where the Democratic Party, although it's split nationally and they were running John C. Breckinridge on the Southern Democratic Party and uh, Illinois Senator Stephen A. Douglas for the Northern Democrat Party. Uh, here in York County, as well as a few other counties, uh, the candidates ran together on the ballot as a fusion ticket, sometimes called the Redding ticket because in Reading, Pennsylvania is where this idea uh, started to put these candidates back together. Uh, you can see uh, the Democrats pick up 5,400 votes. Lincoln gets 5,100. Uh, it's actually pretty close. I mean, Lincoln hangs in there. Uh, if you add the other two uh, candidates, uh, Tennessee Senator John Bell and Stephen Douglas, you know, Lincoln loses by about 1,300 votes or so in York County. If you look nationally, you can see the map. Uh, red, of course, being Lincoln. The darker red, the more pronounced his victory. Blue, Stephen A. Douglas. Yellow is John Bell, the, uh, who's really got strength in only a few counties, mostly along the Mason-Dixon line or the border between the slave states and the free states. Uh, in the South, John C. Breckinridge is green. Look at York County. We go green, uh, as do several other counties in Pennsylvania that support the fusion ticket, uh, which again is John Breckeridge and Stephen Douglas together. This is instructive in my mind. This is how York County voted by township. Uh, notice that what is immediately apparent. Uh, the farther north you are, with most, with a couple exceptions, and Carol Gross were notably, you tend to be a Republican. The farther south you get, with the exception of Springfield Township, where it was really close, and Hanover, which was overwhelmingly Republican, uh, it's Democrat. You know, and it's funny because these political things, you know, bear in mind again the fact that Southern York County historically is tied to Maryland and tied to Baltimore, and Northern and Eastern York County are tied to Harrisburg and Philadelphia, uh, which tend to, of course, to have a little different uh, political leanings and a little different politics. Now, only one Yorker that I can find actually went to Lincoln's inauguration. Um, A.B. Farker uh, got on a train, went down to Washington, uh, and he talked about uh, what he saw. And he was a Lincoln supporter, uh, thought he had plenty of common sense, was a strong president, uh, you know, really backed him. And, uh, you know, he says, Lincoln's speeches and declarations affected me deeply, more deeply than I can well describe. What Farker could not have known in that inauguration in March of 1861 was how tightly connected he was going to become with Abraham Lincoln over time. In fact, he will get a personal audience with Lincoln, uh, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. April, of course, 1861, uh, Lincoln's only been in office less than a month. And of course, the nation is shocked to learn as Yorkers are shocked to learn that we're now at war 
with the firing on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. Uh, here in York, there's a lot of political divide at the start of the war. Uh, now, typically in those days, and to, to some degree today, newspapers tended to be political. Uh, the York Gazette uh, was a Democratic newspaper, highly Democratic. Um, the York Republican, of course, was a Republican paper over time, and there was an attempt briefly to have an independent newspaper called the Pennsylvanian. Let's talk about the Gazette first, uh, because that's the dominant newspaper in the entire county, and other than the uh, paper in the papers in Harrisburg, this was probably the largest circulation of any paper between Baltimore and the Susquehanna River. Uh, the editor is David Small. Uh, David Small is the Chief Burgess of York as well. He also runs the Democratic Party, uh, holds, holds tremendous political clout. Uh, at the start of the war, he's really, really uh, not a fan of Abraham Lincoln by any stretch, certainly not a fan of Republican Governor Curtin. Uh, he does support the idea of going to war. Uh, in fact, the York Gazette uh, will help turn out the troops uh, and get people involved in the military effort. But throughout the war, uh, David Small is going to be a pretty bitter uh, critic of Lincoln. The Republican is uh, edited by a guy very familiar to the York County History Center. In fact, uh, YCHC owns the Bonham House, uh, one of the many fine museums that you can visit uh, with YCHC. Uh, uh, Horace Bonham's a strong Republican. Uh, he's a big Lincoln supporter. He frequently gets into editorial wars with David Small, uh, accusing each other of all kinds of different things that even today might be considered somewhat libel, uh, libelous or at minimum sarcastic. Uh, but he and James Kell, he's heavily influenced by his good friend James Kell. Uh, and finally in 1862, he shuts the paper down after Lincoln uh, rewards uh, Bonham uh, with his, for his patronage. Uh, by naming him the local tax collector, which I'm sure went over real well with the Democrats of this area now that the Republican was taking their tax money. Uh, the other newspaper uh, of any size was the Hanover Spectator. Uh, it was neutral originally. Uh, when the owner died, um, you know, the widow Maria Leader took over the newspaper. She wasn't nearly as neutral as her husband was. She tended to be far more pro-Republican, uh, particularly as the war went on and on and competed with the German language uh, Democrat paper, which a lot of the country folk in and around Hanover tended to prefer. The York County Star and Wrightsville Advertiser was the final paper that I wanna talk about. Uh, that was uh, owned by Robert W. Smith and William Albright. Uh, you can see the York County Star, uh, again, Wrightsville Advertiser. Uh, that was their edition on July 4th, 1861. Uh, they tended to try to be neutral. It was the only paper in Wrightsville. Uh, but they ended up having a shutdown when most of their employees joined the army. And in fact, finally, Robert W. Smith himself joins the army and the star gets shut down for many years. Now, the two papers, uh, particularly in York, the Republican and the uh, York Gazette, uh, throw out a lot of terms towards one another. But the two that are really stuck are the two that actually are most found in the national press of those days and that is the Copperheads uh, or Black Republicans. Copperheads, of course, a uh, poisonous snake. Um, I grew up in Southeastern Ohio in the Hill Country and we had plenty of Copperheads in that area. Uh, we had plenty of Copperheads during the Civil War in Southern Ohio as well, as you did here in York County during the war years. Uh, and you can see this cartoon that appeared in Harper's Weekly showing Columbia, you know, America, if you will, uh, fighting, of course, the copperhead element of the Democratic Party uh, that didn't want to prosecute the war, they wanted to prosecute peace. Well, the York Gazette responded to that, talking about the Republicans, uh, you know, the opposite of the copperheads, the black snake. And I love this quote from the pen of David Small. The black snake is a cowardly, hissing, thieving reptile. He possesses somewhat the power to charm. He always charges the innocent to destruction. He robs birds' nests, sucks hen's eggs, will often be found curled around the legs of a cow sucking her milk, just as black Republican contractors, jobbers, and office holders are now doing with Uncle Sam's cow. Great quote. I mean, David, David Small is, uh, certainly had a pen, I'll say that. But again, it just shows the, the depth of feeling between the Democrats and Republicans. I mean, today's issues between the two parties are nothing new by any stretch of the imagination. 
uh, Democratic Party response in August the 20th with their annual meeting. Uh, they're going to meet in uh, Sam Lewis's tavern down in Chancellor Township. Uh, and, they and they really start linking the Republican Party to the Negro movement, uh, or as they say again, the Black Republicans. It was more than just a Black snake. Uh, they were trying to link the idea of Republicans and abolitionism uh, as divisive and the sole, sole cause of the division uh, between the country. Uh, and of course, the Democrats believed they were the only party that were still adhering to the Constitution. Uh, so they are, you know, re-energizing, if you will, the electorate. Uh, and obviously throughout 1861 and 1862, dissatisfaction with Lincoln grows in York County and along the border. Some of that's because of his suspension of habeas corpus uh, down in Maryland. Some of that's because of Ambrose Burnside forcibly, without authorization, taking over Fort Federal Hill, overlooking Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Uh, some of it was because Lincoln had made a lot of promises, at least in the Democratic minds, to speedily end the war. Uh, of course, he had originally thought it was going to end in 90 days and had called the troops out, 75,000 troops for that uh, length of time. Uh, more importantly to a lot of people, uh, inflation was, was running rampant. Uh, taxes were being raised by the Republican Party to try to counteract some of that. And Lincoln's administration got off to a rocky start uh, with a lot of corruption, uh, not by Lincoln, but certainly by some of his key cabinet members, in particular, Maytown, Pennsylvania, over in Lancaster County's favorite son, um, Simon Cameron, Secretary of War, uh, was accused of corruption and uh, leaning military contracts towards the Pennsylvania Railroad, Northern Central Railway, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Wilmington, Delaware Railway, other ones he had a financial or other interest in. Uh, so dissatisfaction with Lincoln is certainly also aided by the fact that the war effort's not going very well. Uh, by the summer of 1862, a lot of people are very discouraged. Uh, Peninsula campaign's been a disaster. The Valley campaign, some guy named Stonewall Jackson has made a mockery of a number of Union generals there. And here in South Central Pennsylvania, uh, there's a lot of press, particularly David Small, uh, in the York Gazette talking about the failure of the Lincoln uh, administration. And then in July of 1862, the Congress passes two laws that will tear the country apart, what's left of the United country at least, uh, the Militia Act of 1862. Uh, the Democrats go nuts uh, because number one, this confirms in their mind that the Lincoln administration's tying the war into black uh, movements. Now keep in mind, this is before the Emancipation Proclamation. But the Militia Act 1862 allows blacks to serve as war laborers and soldiers. Now, that's eventually not gonna happen, at least not for a year almost. Um, but the other one that becomes pretty controversial is Lincoln passes the Confiscation Act, which again, you know, leads to the Emancipation Proclamation in which he frees the slaves of any rebels that are found guilty of treason. Now, most rebels you can't get to because they're behind the armies uh, in the South and the South's winning the war, at least holding their own uh, in the summer of 1862. Uh, so there's really no real teeth to this uh, law, but it provides the legal groundwork for the Emancipation Proclamation. Now here in York County, there are a lot of concerns. You read the newspapers, certain letters and diaries, some of which are in the collection of YCHC, in fact. Uh, people are concerned that the free slaves are going to come take their jobs away. Uh, times are hard, uh, inflation's up, but people don't want to lose their jobs to all these freed slaves who they think are going to come north and take them. So uh, it still uh, ends up as a political football. And of course, David Small's got to respond. Uh, and so the York Gazette publishes that, you know, all this is a scheme by the Republicans, particularly the president. Uh, this scheme's unpopular throughout America. It's certainly gonna fail. Um, now, the, the talk of the Emancipation Proclamation was already there in the summer of 1862. Uh, certainly wouldn't be uh, drafted until after, or issued at least till after the Battle of Antietam in September. Uh, and wouldn't go into effect until January of 1863. But the Gazette thought that the slave states had to do it themselves. The federal government couldn't enforce it. 
that Maryland to Virginia, Delaware, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, places like that, they had, to, they had to do the emancipation themselves, that the army couldn't force it in, and that outside agitation, a la the Republicans and Mr. Lincoln's army, really had no impact. Well, as the war drags on and on in 1862, the Confederates keep piling up the victories, uh, recruitment goes way down, and people aren't willing to join the U.S. Army at that point in time. Uh, here in York County, the commissioners in late July of 1862 resort to authorizing $15,000 in 1862 money uh, to try to buy off new recruit, recruits. Uh, they were offering $50 a man to join. It doesn't work. Uh, they're only going to get two companies, roughly a couple hundred men uh, in York, one company in Hanover, and that's it in the entire county. Uh, actually, I end up with $15,000 uh, a lot of that money's left because they simply don't have uh, the need to spend it on soldiers who aren't coming. Lincoln calls for 300,000 volunteers for nine months. Uh, wants 21 regiments, so 21,000 of these men to come from Pennsylvania. Doesn't happen. Uh, Secretary of War authorizes a draft uh, for to try to get new men. Uh, and there's riots in Wisconsin and unrest in Pennsylvania. And the draft doesn't really do a whole lot, at least at this point in time. Well, York County and start chipping in more and more money. Uh, you can see here in August 1862, again from the Gazette, this is, we're now up to $115. Uh, that's 65 more dollars than we were offering before. But there's fine print. And the fine print is that you're not going to get that money up front. Uh, you're going to get uh, you know, premium for enlistment, bounty from the government. Uh, but uh, they were going to actually end up paying this in installments. Uh, but the 130th Pennsylvania becomes the first regiment race in York County uh, using predominantly what are, you know, are men that are bought with bounties. Um, now, the 130th is going to serve only a few weeks before the very first combat deaths. Uh, up till now, York County's escaped pretty well. Nobody's died in combat, uh, at least any great degree, until, until the Battle of Antietam on September 17th, 1862. 130th Pennsylvania gets in a nasty firefight, uh, and they're going to lose 178 men, 32 of which, including several York Countyans, are killed. And of course, the political reaction from the Democrats are one of horror that now men are dying in York County, uh, men that you know the president had to buy to join the army. Uh, and so what happens across the country in 1862, the midterm elections, uh, is Lincoln takes a pounding in the Republican Party. Uh, now, in New York, it's very interesting that a pro-Lincoln war Democrat actually wins. Uh, kind of somewhat shocking that in the middle of a net loss of 22 seats for the Republican Party, York County flips uh, and flips Republican uh, for one of the very few times in its history. Uh, but Adams County flips the other direction, where the incumbent uh, Republican, Edward McPherson, uh, most of you obviously are familiar with the Gettysburg Battlefield or familiar with the McPherson Ridge, McPherson's barn uh, off of U.S. Route 30 on the west side of Gettysburg. Well, McPherson loses uh, to uh, a Democrat uh, where York County flips. So net net, it all uh, works out. Uh, but the Republicans are in real trouble. I mean, Lincoln uh, sees the results of the midterms, knows the Democratic Party uh, is going on. Uh, and David Small continues to just, he's venomous at times. Uh, and it's February 17th, uh, he takes his pen and his sarcastic wit comes to the front. Uh, and he mocks uh, the Republican Party's uh, comments that if you elect Lincoln, we're going to have good times. Uh, says, elect Lincoln, they'll have uh, plenty of work and high wages. Expenses of government will be reduced when the Republicans were talking about a smaller government. Uh, and elect Lincoln up the South succeeds, we'll send a few regiments of wide awakes down there and wipe them out in 30 days. Elect Lincoln, there'll be plenty of money. Elect Lincoln, we'll have honesty and reform. Elect Lincoln, and we'll bring the government back to the policy of our father. Well, Lincoln was elected, and we have plenty of work, such as wading in blood to our knees, digging graves for our young men, taking care of the maimed, wounded widows and orphans. Uh, and of course, he very prominently in the same newspaper starts publishing lists of York County soldiers that are dying. Uh, and, you know, certainly, you know, he's got a valid point uh, that, at least from the Democratic uh, idea, Lincoln's policies aren't working. 
everything hits the fan uh, just a few months later here in South Central Pennsylvania, as we all know, the Gettysburg Campaign. Uh, one of the reasons Robert E. Lee wants to come to Southern Pennsylvania is the political climate in Pennsylvania at the time. Uh, he's hoping that by winning a major victory on Northern soil, that the peace Democrats will rise up as one and will, you know, bring Lincoln to the negotiating table. In fact, uh, you know, at that point in the war, in late June 1863, George Woodward, a judge, is running as the peace Democrat against Andy Curtin for governor. And a lot of people think Woodward's going to win, uh, which, of course, would depose the uh, Republican in charge of the, of the largest state that went Republican in 1860 and flip that, of course, to a Democrat. Lincoln calls out 100,000 militia on June 15th when he gets word of the debacle at the Second Battle of Winchester, where the 87th Pennsylvania from York and Adams County uh, loses almost two thirds of their men. Uh, in what at that point is the worst military disaster that had befallen a York County unit, unit, unit in the entire war to this date. Uh, and Lincoln gets almost no response. Uh, he wants 50,000 of these men to come from Pennsylvania, 25,000 from West Virginia, 25,000 from uh, Ohio, including my great-great-grandfather, who joins 141st Ohio uh, Volunteers to guard the Ohio River. Um, now, Governor Curtin has put out his own place saying the enemy's coming. Uh, they're coming to Harrisburg. Uh, and he calls out the state militia. Problem is he doesn't get a lot of support. Um, now in downtown York, uh, there's a lot of concern among the Republicans that if the Confederates come to York County, uh, that the Democrats are gonna help them. In fact, uh, young attorney, James Latimer, uh, prominent attorney, uh, even then at a young age, very prominent after the war, uh, the Latimer's very concerned that the Copperheads, as he, you know, the Republicans call them, the Peace Democrats in York County are going to rise up and actually support uh, the Confederate Army. Well, Saturday, June 27th, as we all know, is the day that the Confederates uh, march into York County for the first time, uh, coming from Gettysburg, where they've chased off the Pennsylvania state militia. Uh, A.B. Farker, as we know, uh, the guy who had supported Lincoln at the start of the war, uh, is in a meeting uh, at the uh, P.A. Uh, Philip Albright Smalls uh, hardware store on the uh, northeast side of the square. Farker's tired of all the political rhetoric. Uh, he's kind of young. He's a hothead to some degree, even though he's a Quaker. Uh, he's certainly impatient. And he jumps in his buggy, rides out to Abbottstown, finds a Confederate general named John B. Gordon, and starts talking about the peaceful occupation of York uh, and you know, what it would take for the rebels to leave York alone and protect the women and children. Well, uh, Farker doesn't have any authorization to do this, none whatsoever. Uh, so he rides back to York and tells the politicians gathered there what he's did. Uh, they realize their hands some have been forced. And so David Small, uh, the editor of the Gazette, the anti-Republican head of the Democratic Party, and publisher of the York Gazette, jumps in Farquhar's uh, carriage, uh, takes uh, some members of city council with them, and they go out to the Alden farmhouse. Um, and there they are going to negotiate the peaceful occupation of York, which in some accounts uh, use, use the term surrender, of course. Um, well, as the Confederates start marching into Adams, New York County, they see hundreds of citizens that are making strange hand gestures they're crying peace, peace, even though many of these guys are German and don't know a lot of English, uh, particularly on the countryside. Uh, and they're making strange hand gestures and waving these yellow pieces of paper. Uh, now, a con men from New York City had passed through Southern Pennsylvania and for $1, they would sell you these bogus membership cards, the Knights of the Golden Circle, a secret pro-Confederate sympathy group that as far as I can tell, didn't really have any basis in York County. Uh, these kind men from New York City were happy to take the farmer's money. And as soon as the rebels showed up, uh, they'd been told by the, uh, the farmers been told by the kind men that the rebels weren't going to bother them because they were a friend of the South. The Confederates figured out really fast that those farms were the ones you wanted to go to because of the horses, the cows, everything was still there. Um, the adjutant of the 1st Louisiana Brigade, the Louisiana Tigers, William J. Seymour wrote, much to our surprise, 
hundreds of people in the towns, uh, Adams, New York, and Franklin counties, through which we passed, greeted us with these signs, and we joyfully accepted them as proof of the anti-war feeling that pervaded the country. So you can see even the rank and file line officers in the Confederate Army were well aware of the fact that South Central Pennsylvania was Copperhead country. Uh, the Confederates knew it. Uh, they, you know, certainly most people in America that followed the press knew this was certainly not a friendly area to the Lincoln administration. As we know, uh, the Confederates march into York uh, as part of the termed uh, peaceful occupation slash surrender. Uh, this is uh, courtesy of the York County History Center. This is Louis Miller's, uh, one of his two sketches of the Confederates arriving in downtown York. This shows General Jubal Early, the commander of the Confederate troops and his right-hand man, Brigadier General John Gordon of Georgia, as they march into Center Square. Now, he le Louis Miller leaves out the uh, market sheds in this picture, but otherwise, it's a fairly interesting de depiction. Now, one thing that happens here in York as General Gordon, a uh, little girl uh, somewhere on Market Street in the general area of YCHC, um, slips out of the crowd, hands General Gordon on his horse a bouquet of uh, flowers. He later says red roses uh, with, the, as he says, the complete description of the defenses of Wrightsville, uh, which happens to be where the Confederates are marching at that point. Uh, John Gordon's job is to take that bridge. Well, one thing the Confederates note, as does Cassandra Moore Small, um, who is a uh, lives in where the Lafayette uh, Club was, across from the Yorktown. Um, she writes about the fact that several Yorkers were copperheads, including Dr. Ness, one of the town's leading physicians. But she talks about the fact that there were Confederate flags waving from the National Hotel. Uh, that, of course, is now the Holy Hound Wine Bar. Uh, they, as you can see there, a very popular landmark in York. But can you imagine people on those rails waving little or big Confederate flags in a northern town, the largest northern town, in fact, that the Confederates were going to occupy the entire war. Um, Jubal Early, as we know, uh, ransoms York for $100,000. Uh, you know, when he's going to leave town, he's finally going to tell people, you know, I could have burned your town down, but I, but I didn't, even though that's what you guys were doing down south. Well, a bipartisan committee uh, with five Republicans on it, uh, five Democrats, uh, go uh, door to door. They're going to collect $28,610. Uh, the four men that are on the list I know are Republicans because they show up on the list of Republican Party bigwigs uh, in the 1860s. Uh, Charles Morris and Charles Weather are Democrats. Latimer Smalls, probably the other Republican, uh, with his relationship, of course, to Samuel Small, uh, everyone else, including Laux, that's Laux Road, uh, everyone else is a Democrat in this list. But there's two key points. One, it's a bipartisan committee, and two, uh, your peer workers, both Democrats and Republicans, are giving uh, to this fund. Now, Joe Borley will never get the rest of the 72000 despite uh, somewhat jokingly asking for it at the end of the war. Well, Farker's got a reputation now that he's the guy that surrendered York. He goes down to Washington because he's a little concerned about what did I do, um, why are people picking on me, uh, and he walks into the White House, then there's the executive mansion, and he walks into Abraham Lincoln's office, gets a gets an interview with Lincoln, and Lincoln uh, turns to the Secretary of War, an Ohioan named Edward McMaster Stanton, and tells him that uh, you know I captured the I don't actually New Yorker I guess, uh, but I captured the young chap who sold York, PA to the rebels. What are we going to do with them? Uh, and, you know, over time, as these two guys tease at one another, in effect, they say, well, you know, Farker, you should be a colonel. Well, you know, we'll make you a colonel of the infantry. Uh, Farker, of course, doesn't join as a colonel. He's paid for a substitute early in the war to replace him so he could pursue his business interests. Uh, but there are certainly political leanings. Um, as the war goes on, in the fall of 1863, uh, one of the leading Democrats in York, uh, uh, Sam Young, owns the largest bookstore in town. No, not the York Emporium, uh, but an early version of that, Young's bookstore on Market Street. Uh, he switches allegiance and starts uh, uh, his own newspaper. And what I love, he calls it the York Democrat, but it's a Republican paper. Uh, obviously trying to sell copies to people who don't know better at the front, thinking that it's yet another Democratic paper. 
uh, but he starts, you know, publishing a Republican, very pro Lincoln, very pro anti uh, curtain paper because uh, the York Republicans long gone by then. Uh, we don't have a Republican paper, and now he does. And the true Democrat, by the way, it still exists. That's what's now known as the York Dispatch. Uh, the York Gazette is the forerunner of today's York uh, Daily Record. Uh, the gubernatorial election of 1863, uh, Woodward uh, loses badly in Pennsylvania. Look what he does in York County. Uh, here in York County, George Woodward, the judge, Peace Democrat, uh, you know, racks up 2,500 more votes than Governor Curtin does, although Curtin carries the state uh, barely. Only wins by about 15,000 votes. And of course, as you can imagine, David Small and the York Gazette uh, thoroughly uh, support George Woodward. Uh, in the fall of 1863, Lincoln makes his one and only visit alive to York County. He's never been here before, as far as we know. Uh, shows up in Hanover Junction on November uh, 1863. This photograph may or may not show Lincoln in Hanover Junction. Some people think it does. I don't. Uh, but there are other people who do certainly support this as being Lincoln, and I certainly respect that view. Uh, but we do know Lincoln is in Hanover Junction. Uh, the day before the Gettysburg Address, uh, most of us have memorized the Gettysburg Address, but none of us have probably memorized the Hanover Address. Uh, Lincoln actually, uh, on the from the back of his train car, uh, talks to the people of Hanover assembled at the train station on the north side of town, uh, and you know he knows the politics. Uh, there's a battle fought here last summer. He asked him, did you fight them any? The rebels were here, did you fight them? Uh, obviously knowing the answer, but it's a little subtle jab at York Countyans, uh, you know, as far as what was happening here politically. Fast forward to March of 1864 and David Small gets reelected uh, as Chief Burgess. I mean, Small is really popular in York uh, and he wins easily uh, by the new political party. Uh, the former Constitutional Union Party, a number of peace, uh, sorry, war Democrats as they're called, and the Republicans have now merged into one new national party uh, that will make one and only appearance in uh, presidential election uh, or local politics in 1864. Uh, the peace uh, Democrat, Dave Small, easily defeats the war Democrat, uh, George Wants. Uh, and again, I love this because we're going back to the Gettysburg campaign. Dave Small can't let it go. Uh, the people have shown by their votes their appreciation of the authorities for their honor and safety of the people and their property while these abolition leaguers, the Republicans, ran away, deserving their homes. Now, partially it's true because people like the Republican uh, Chief Burgess of Hanover indeed did leave to protect his horses. Um, but he's like, you know, I stayed, you know, I was here. Uh, maybe we surrendered the town, but I was here. Uh, and these Republicans ran off. 1864, the war is dragging on again. Now in 64, uh, Lincoln is, has serious doubts whether he's gonna get reelected. Uh, and I just love this, this painting that from the uh, um, Minnesota State Capitol, uh, which uh, one of my favorite paintings when I've toured the Capitol over the years just showing the general dejection of, you know, people are tired, wars dragging on, people have died, uh, it's pretty bad. In 1864, uh, the Republicans, so by, by the fall of 1864, everything's flipped. Uh, Atlanta's fallen, Savannah's on its way to falling, uh, Sheridan has uh, torn apart the valley, uh, Shenandoah Valley. Uh, the war's clearly going in Lincoln's direction. Robert E. Lee's retreated into Richmond and Petersburg and entrenched. Uh, and most people now believe the end's in sight. Uh, and the Republicans are gonna have in a massive victory on the polls in 1864. Uh, they're gonna pick up 50 seats. Remember they lost 22 back at the midterm. So now they've picked up 28 more than they even lost back then for a huge gain. Uh, but York County flips again, uh, where the Democrat lost Benner who had lost in 1862 now wins. Uh, against the, so for the second time in the congressional election, York County goes opposite of what most of America does. Uh, Joe Bailey, who is not from York County, uh, Glassbrenner is, uh, but Bailey is a strong supporter of Lincoln uh, and he will be a voice for Lincoln in Congress. Uh, again, you can see the vote here locally for Glassbrenner. Uh, 
Um, but the big news in 1864, of course, the presidential election. And I love these broadsides. And again, long before robocalls uh, and TV ads, things that like annoy us to death today, it was basically done by word of mouth or by political broadsides that would be posted up wherever you wanted to see. Uh, and I like this. This obviously is a Democratic uh, uh, poster. Elect Lincoln and the Black Republican ticket. You will bring on Negro equality, more debt, harder times, another draft. So again, those are the big issues. Negro equality, debt, inflation, obviously, hard times, and the draft. I mean, the draft is wildly unpopular still in places. Universal anarchy and ultimate ruin. Of course, if you vote against Lincoln, you vote for George McClellan, uh, the only time an active member of the US military has ever run against the President of the United States. Uh, Major General McClellan, uh, Democratic ticket, you will defeat Negro equality, restore prosperity, reestablish the Union in an honorable, permanent, and happy peace. Love those quotes. Uh, but again, it shows just how divided America really is. 1864, York County smashes Lincoln, just smashes him. Uh, remember last time he's only lost by less than 1,500 votes? Look now, he loses by you know 3,200 votes. I and mean, Lincoln gets destroyed in York County. Uh, now the soldier vote, actually <laughs> in the hospital vote, uh, go heavily for Lincoln. That's about the only thing he can say he claims. Look now at the political map in 1864. Most of the counties below Windsor Township is the only township now remaining in the, uh, along the river on the east side that has not flipped. Uh, it stayed Republican. Uh, Springfield's flipped. Surprisingly, Fawn Grove flipped the other way back to the Republicans the first time ever. Um, but now Northern York County, Monahan Township has flipped uh, to the Republicans uh, as has uh, Helen Township or it's flipped to the Democrats. Well, finally, as I near the end of my talk, we're near the end of the Civil War. Uh, as we know, uh, on April 9th, 1865, at Appomattox Courthouse, Robert E. Lee will surrender the Army in Northern Virginia, at least what's left of it, most of the Army at least, uh, to Ulysses S. Grant. That news brings rejoicing from both the Democrats and the Republicans of York County, uh, but very quickly that joy turns to grief. Uh, as Lincoln is shot on April 14th, a good, uh, good Friday at Ford's Theater. He dies, of course, the next morning at the Peterson House in Washington. Uh, and uh, on April 21st, on a very dismal, rainy, ugly uh, day here in York County, Lincoln makes his second and final visit to York County. He's dead, doesn't know he's here. Uh, he's on a funeral train, but what I really like, and it shows maybe the ultimate York County gesture. This county does not support Abraham Lincoln, violently opposed to Abraham Lincoln in some cases, throwing rocks at his supporters way back in 1860, voting his supporters out of office, uh, turning out uh, Republicans. Uh, and yet in townships that were overwhelmingly Democrat, people stood by the railroad tracks, dressed in their black mourning clothes, with their hats in their hand in a driving rainstorm to honor the dead president of the United States, putting aside their political uh, differences with the president and joining the Republicans in mourning them. Well, uh, and you can see here in York County and Wrightsville, copperheads are silent as a grave. They dare not open their mouths. Uh, the army, you know, Lincoln's death casts a gloom over the entire army. Uh, private, uh, actually Sergeant, I think, uh, Abraham Rudisill, uh, artilleryman from York. Our chief is indeed dead. Ah, uh, but there's still a few diehard Democrats out there. Down in Round Hill, Pennsylvania, Sir Lincoln Wright, he should have been shot long ago. And on that gesture, we will end tonight's presentation. Thank you very much. Some of these stories are in Jim's and my new book uh, that's now available. The York County History Center has copies of the book uh, at the gift shop. So if you want a copy, go there or on uh, December 5th, uh, Jim and I will be doing book signing at Civil War and More in the Canicksburg. On December 12th, we'll be doing a book signing at the aforementioned York Emporium. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing and I will turn it back over to you, Adam, for any closing comments. Uh, really a fascinating and wide ranging uh, discussion.
Thank you. And just relating, yeah, relating the local political situation to the national one helps to put everything into clearer perspective. Although there's a little, there are some muddled things you, you discussed with some of those elections. Yeah, some of them flip when you don't think they're going to flip. The position of the uh, the war Democrats is was such a difficult one um, because I, I don't know. I, I admit that I'm not uh, terribly well read on them, but their heart really wasn't. I mean, it's it always goes back to that question of what was the Civil War about? Um, and it depends entirely on who you ask and at what time. Okay. Um, you know, defending the Union, you know, in 1861, but obviously the war changed so much by 1860, even by 1862, and certainly by 1865. So um, <clears throat> we have a number of, we have a number of questions which I'd like to get to. And uh, if anyone would like to send in some questions right now, that would be just great. Uh, please write them into the chat and I will share them with Scott. Uh, but one thing I wanted to share before going into the questions is, uh, and I was remiss in not mentioning this earlier uh, when I went through the whole calendar of events, but um, almost needless to say, we are in a changing environment right now. Um, and while we're planning a full slate of events over the next few weeks, please check our website or give us a call uh, or if it's a library event, feel free to write me um, by email uh, just to make sure that things are uh, still going on as planned. Um, because at this point, we're, we're, we're monitoring the news like everybody else is, and we want to be responsive uh, as much as we can be to uh, the needs to change. Uh, that being said, um, let's, let's start going back through. Uh, First, I'm going to try to focus on questions that specifically pertain to things you discussed tonight, and then we have some some other general questions. Um, so the and this is a question that I had as well uh, after looking through your slides. So where did the term "wide awakes" come from? Uh, generally, to the very standpoint that these were young, aggressive. Uh, Lincoln supporters who were wide awake to the needs of the country. Um, that was where the term generally started. There is some debate about the, the actual origins of the term, but in general, it was the fact that these guys were progressives. They were uh, you know, wide awake to the needs. Uh, and part of that was a throwback to what they thought was the sleepiness, if you will, uh, of James Buchanan in his administration that the Democrats had lost touch with what was going on throughout the country and you know, were oblivious where the Republicans were wide awake to the needs of the country. Uh, and so that's the explanation I've heard the most and the one that makes the most sense to me. Uh, to, beyond the 1860 election, have you seen this occur in any elections after that, that that was like a faction within the Republican party? No, this was really pretty much, you know, a Lincoln type thing. I mean, there were always, you know, young members of the group, but and they tried to use the wide awake name a few other times, but it's generally, you know, pretty much regarded as an 1860 phenomenon uh, okay. that, you know, you can only accuse the Democrats of being sleepy one time before that gets to be old, I guess. Uh, and so the term just kind of fell out of favor over the, over the, over the years. All right. Oh, I didn't see this question. This is a great question. Um, this question is, the last question, by the way, was from Gary. Um, this next question is from Wayne. Did the division between the Northern Townships, Republican, and the Southern Townships, Democrat, persist after the Civil War? Yeah, it actually did. Uh, you know, if you go out and look at the, uh, the election of 1868, uh, for example, uh, yeah, you'll see pretty much the same charts. I know Carl Hatch uh, has uh, published uh, a lot of the York County results for the 19th, 20th centuries, which I think York County History Center has a copy of Mr. Hatch's uh, findings. I think it's even a book format. Um, but that's fascinating to go through that and look because yeah, there was always the split that went on. 
Uh, thank you. It's my timer telling me to stop talking in the presentation and leave time for questions. Um, so yeah, there was always a split. I will tell you kind of an interesting anecdote. I've, I've told this to a lot of people. Being a Cleveland Browns fan moving to York County in 2001, I could have predicted the politics of York County because one of the things that struck me, I even told my wife, I called home one time, said, you know, Northern York County seems to all be Steelers fans. Eastern York County tends to be more Eagles fans starting to be mixed. And Southern York County is all Ravens. And of course, being a Browns fan, I detested the Ravens in those days because uh, it was too fresh and too painful at that point in time. But little did I know about the politics, but you know, that's 2001 uh, to an outsider viewing York County's connections to Pittsburgh and Philadelphia in the east and north and Baltimore in the south. And I think, mm -hmm. frankly, if you drove, or next time you guys drive around, you know, York County, start looking for the football flags in people's yards and the bumper stickers. And I think you'll find it's still true. That's an interesting, um, that's an interesting comparison. Uh, but, but yeah, I think regional. So, so I guess maybe one thing that we could, if we want to make connections um, between 2020 and 1860, I mean, regionalism is such a, determining factor, I guess we could say, in, in voting allegiances. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, another question here from Wayne. Uh, going back, I think you mentioned taxes a few times, specifically when um, these would be war-related taxes. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? Because um, Wayne's asking, are you, are you referring to tariffs or I guess excise taxes, or are you talking about income taxes because there was no federal income tax? Yeah, obviously the Civil War was, was the impetus eventually for um, starting that. Uh, property taxes certainly were going up. Uh, there's no doubt of that. Um, there were luxury taxes that were being enacted. In fact, some of you may be aware that I collect um, Civil War, what's called CART uh, day to, uh, visits or CDVs. I know the York County History Center has mm -hmm. got a massive collection of we those. We do. Um, if you look on the back, a lot of those, the ones that are from 1861 and 62, 63, don't have stamps on them. Uh, 1864 and 65, you must, uh, if you want to okay. buy a print, a uh, photographic print, you had to have a stamp on it to show that you pay the excise tax, uh, luxury tax, if you will on the ability to do that. And the, you know, taxes on liquor, there were taxes mm. on uh, you know, perfumes, uh, certain imported uh, goods. Uh, I mean, the taxes were just things that people were used to paying in those days. Uh, so yeah, particularly as the war piled up, more and more of these taxes were being added on. Great, okay. Just scrolling down here. Okay, this is another great question. Um, again, from, from Gary, were there ever draft riots in York County? Uh, never found evidence of an actual draft riot. Uh, there was certainly draft unrest. Uh, there was unrest in Pennsylvania in 1862 when the first draft was tried to, to be passed. By the summer of 1863, the draft's really not popular. Of course, you have major draft riots in New York City. Uh, you have some, you know, draft riots in other cities as well. But York County, it seems relatively tame. Now, you got a, a lot of people who don't like it. Uh, you certainly have people who resist the draft in the newspapers uh, uh, and, and the military records of the day talk openly about draft dodgers. And I have several stories that Jim and I have in our new book, in fact, about draft dodgers here in York County. But Gary, to answer your question, no, there's not a lot of general, you know, rioting in the streets or anything. Just a lot of people upset, uh, you know, and there are demonstrations and, you know, people making speeches against it, but nobody's really getting hostile. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, all right. This is a, this is a general question and uh, it's from Bill. And I believe he asked this to, uh, to a previous speaker a few months ago. Um, but, uh, it's a great question, uh, and your perspective, I think, would be helpful on this. Uh, so he is asking you to rank the following museums. 
Um, and I don't think they're in any particular order. Uh, first, uh, I think the Seminary Ridge Museum in Gettysburg, uh, the Harrisburg National Civil War Museum, Gettysburg Visitor Center, and uh, the Richmond, I can't remember the full title. Uh, oh, Museum of the Confederacy, what used to be now the American Civil War Museum. Yes, that's right, that's right. Uh, I've not been in the new museum at Tredegar uh, since it opened. I was supposed to speak in Richmond at the Richmond Civil War Roundtable uh, back during the summer. And we all know what happened to summer presentations out of state. Right. Uh, so I, I've not been to that. I did. I was in the Museum of the Confederacy, the predecessor in Richmond, uh, opposite the uh, Jefferson Davis's mansion, uh, presidential mansion. That was a great museum. Uh, Force ranking is really interesting because they're all different. Uh, Seminary Ridge Museum is a, a much smaller facility. Uh, wonderful job of interpreting the civilian life and in, in, uh, in, in theological life in Adams County, as well as obviously uh, the military and hospital usage of that facility. That's uh, certainly a favorite of mine. Uh, my good friend uh, Wayne Motz is the uh, head of the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg. Uh, I have nothing but great things to say about that facility. Um, you know, Wayne's a good buddy of mine, uh, but I like that facility uh, very much. Uh, so, you know, if I had to force and rank them, you know, that would be tough, but I would recommend all three, but it really depends on what you're interested in. If you're looking at a broad-based look at the war uh, and uh, the intervening uh, political climate, the National Civil War Museum is great. If you're looking for military artifacts, uh, Tredegar, uh, I'm told, is the best. Uh, and if you're looking for more local, more of a local flavor, may I suggest the York County History Center, which is my favorite museum. There, there's your commercial item. Thank you very much. And I would definitely rank us first as well uh, in that list. Although our Civil War exhibit has been closed for quite some time, as people are sadly aware. Um, but I think we'll be doing uh, we'll be doing a more innovative thing in uh, the new museum once we are in there. Uh, making, doing some different interpretation with our Civil War history. Uh, I am just scanning here um, for any additional questions. This is your last opportunity if you have something you want to ask Scott. But I don't see any additional questions. Okay, so just a quick reminder, if you don't mind, Adam. And sure, uh, absolutely. Jim and I are, are signing books again December 5th uh, from 11 till 2 at Civil War and More. That's 10 South Market Street in Mechanicsburg. Uh, if you don't want to drive up to Mechanicsburg, then you can call them. They will be taking uh, live orders via phone and credit card that day for Jim and I to sign. Uh, if you prefer a more local and don't mind waiting another week, uh, on December 12th, Jim Lewin will host us at the York Emporium. We also are playing a panel discussion uh, that'll be televised. So if, uh, once more details of that are out, you can come quiz Gemini in person uh, and we could do that. Um, and then uh, I dropped off copies of the book today at TG Books out on Industrial Highway at the York County History Center uh, at, uh, you know, obviously on uh, 250 East Market Street. Um, so we've got books now starting to be placed uh, for folks who want to pick them up live. And of course, they're, uh, they're on Amazon. Uh, the book was on the top 10 list so, uh, for Gettysburg bestsellers. So Jim and I are pleased with a great start, and we look forward to talking to you guys again in uh, January. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. And I do not see any additional questions. So... I will thank you again, and I think we'll be, I think we will conclude for the evening. Um, this, this talk will be recorded, and um, we have been uploading them to YouTube lately. I think we plan to do that. Uh, you can, of course, also go back and look at it on Facebook because we, uh, we broadcasted it live on Facebook as well. So, um, also, don't forget, we have an upcoming talk on January 20th. Uh, Although I think you might have just said that, Scott. Um, but uh, about your new edition of uh, Civil War Voices from York County. And uh, I think at that point, I will say good night and thank you very much. Uh, and have a safe holiday season. And we hope to see everybody 
uh, in real life at some point in 2021. Thank you, stay well. All right, thank you.